Did it start recording? Okay, there we go. All right, hi guys, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm Madison Holland. I'm an environmental specialist with the Pollution Control Agency, and I specifically do construction stormwater inspection. So I'm the unfortunate person that comes out, looks at your site and sees if it's in compliance and has to have those talks with you. Hopefully we don't, but um, that is what I do. Probably not your favorite person. Today, I'm just gonna be talking about, you know, subdivisions and common plans of development. And kind of that goes along with that. That's what we've seen the most non-compliance with this year. So that's kind of what we're focusing our outreach on. I know that probably doesn't apply to everybody in the room. So we will be covering slip training, inspections, some sediment and erosion control requirements, terminating the permit and some resources that you guys can use. So to start off with, I have a video, it's short, pretty painless. Um, let's see if we have volume. Air, land, and water. One of the ways in which the NPCA works to reduce pollution is determining certain activities. Specifically, we'll be discussing the NPCA's construction stormwater general permit and exploring how common plans of development are addressed in the permit. The goal of this presentation is to inform developers and contractors how to transfer permit coverage when lots in common plans of developments are bought and sold. So who needs a construction stormwater permit? Construction stormwater permit is required when any construction activity results in the land disturbance of equal to or greater than one acre. The permit is also required when land disturbance is less than one acre, but part of a larger common plan of development. What exactly does a common plan of development mean? A common plan of development or sale, such as a subdivision, base project, or combination of construction activities, is an area where multiple contiguous separate land disturbing activities may occur on different schedules, but under one proposed plan. If, for example, you are building on a half acre residential lot in a 10 acre development, or are putting in a fast food restaurant on a three quarter acre parcel that is part of a 20 acre retail center, that would be considered a common plan of development. Let's take a look at an example. Mr. Johnson owns a large plot of land that he plans to subdivide into 25 different lots for single family homes. He does the mass rating for the site prior to selling off each of the lots separately. Mr. Johnson sells lots 2 through 10 to ABC Homes. Lot 1 to Mr. Smith, and lots 2 through 16 to Speedy Builders. Mr. Johnson and the three new owners will fill out and sign separate subdivision registration forms, and once completed, will submit the forms to the MPCA. Mr. Johnson will then provide the new owners with a copy of the construction stormwater permit and a copy of the stormwater pollution prevention plan, or SWIP, that specifically addresses the remaining construction activity for those lots. Submitting these subdivision registration forms will transfer ownership in all applicable construction stormwater permit responsibilities to each of the new lot owners. Mr. Johnson will remain responsible for the road and permanent stormwater treatment system for the subdivision, as well as any lots that have not yet been sold. The subdivision registration form is free. It's a huge benefit to both the original owner and new lot owners. Not only does it transfer permit responsibility from the original owner to the new owner, but it also prevents the new owners from receiving potential monetary penalties from the MPCA for not having permit coverage. If there's one thing to take away from this video, it is to remember the two steps to selling or buying a lot within a common plan of development. Step one, the original owner and new owner of the lot fill out and sign the same subdivision registration form and submit the form to the MPCA. Step two, the original owner provides the new owner with a copy of the permit and a copy of the SWIP that addresses the remaining construction activity that long. Subdivision registration form can be found on our NPCA construction stormwater website. We also provide many great resources on our website, with everything from guidance documents on a variety of topics, permit overview, and a link to apply for permit coverage. We understand that this process may be confusing. For this reason, another document we provide on our website is a coverage map showing which NPCA construction stormwater inspector is assigned to each county in Minnesota. These inspectors serve as the best resource for any questions you may have about the permit and common plans of development. We encourage everyone to reach out to us with any questions or concerns. The 
Minnesota. All right. So just kind of a summary of everything and the steps you have to take kind of laid out in a format um, for you is that when someone decides with a to have a plot of land that's greater than or equal to an area and they want to develop it, they'll go ahead um, and obtain the coverage before they start. That's a big thing. Some people start working and then decide that they're going to plot it out and then they get coverage. Um, that's, you know, you should have the coverage before you start land disturbance. And that permit that they pull is going to be something that we refer to as a parent permit. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. And then as the developer subdivides out the lots, they'll go ahead um, and fill out the subdivision registration forms with the new owner or operator. And that should be done within 30 days of that sale or transfer. And then the previous developer needs to provide a SWIP in that permit, as I mentioned at the end of the video, to the new lot owner or operator. And so the big reason why we ask that you do this is not only for you, but for us. So we know that there's somebody else working out there. There's somebody else held responsible for those individual lots um, rather than the developer. And then um, for you, if there is work going on, it lets us know um, that you have permit coverage. So filling out this form and submitting it is pretty easy. Um, it does take a couple people. It's not just a one man show where you can fill it out and say, I own this and I sold it to this person and so forth. You need to have both the original developer's permit information and project location, the new developer and new lot owners um, contact information and they'll go ahead and sign for that. And then one thing to note on this is, maybe it's on the next slide, is that if you can't have, um, sometimes there's resistance, you know, with the transfer a lot, there's a lot of paperwork and everything. Um, if you're having a hard time having anybody sign, let us know and we'll make note of that and we'll go ahead and try to get a workaround just so you're not left in the dark or without permit coverage, or if you're the original developer left with the responsibility, even though somebody else owns and is working on that lot. Um, when you do fill them out, you, we can only have one form per email. So that's a huge thing we see is if you're buying lots one through five, um, you can go ahead and write that on your subdivision registration form and submit it all at once, but that means you can only terminate that all at once. So as you finish them, um, what I recommend is if you have them and they're kind of going to be on different timelines and you're the new developer or building out each individual lot that you take responsibility for, um, and they're going to kind of be sold off to new owners as you go to fill out a one form for each of those lots. Otherwise, then you can't terminate that until all lots one through five are done. Um, to submit it, we only take them online and there's instructions up at the top and you'll send it to this email here. And then in the subject line, um, you'll just do a subdivision application. And like we said, it's free. So throw that into your home buyers. Let them know, oh, you just need to fill out this form. It's free, I'll cover it for you. Um, aside from just common plans of development and subdivisions, I'm going to go ahead and cover, you know, some general things in our permit, like the SWIP, the training and the inspection requirements with the SWIP. So stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, hope you all know what that is. If you don't, you should. Um, and the biggest thing with this is that when you transfer that ownership, the current owner needs to provide a SWIP. And the new lot owner can go ahead and amend that, make a new one if they choose to, modify it, um, as long as they have the proper training to do so. Um, some training that is required with our permit or permit is going to be individuals that are preparing the SWIP. Usually, you don't need to worry about that. If you send that through an engineering company, they should have somebody with the proper training to do that. Um, anybody overseeing, implementing, revising, amending, the SWIP and performing inspections has to have a construction site management um, training certificate. Uh, it's a fairly easy course. Um, it does take time, 
but it is good for three years and then you can do a refresher. So you don't need to sit in the classroom again for two more days. Um, and then individuals performing, supervising, installing, maintenance and repair of erosion and sediment controls. So that's a different training. Um, it is something that is required. Usually if you have the construction site manager training, you'll also go ahead and do the construction installer training. They kind of go hand in hand. Some entities that provide this training um, are the U, Mika, and Stormwater One are some common ones I see, but there's also a bunch of different entities at local, state, and federal levels. And so inspections, this is another big thing that I saw with non-compliance this last year, is people not knowing when to do inspections or having inaccurate findings on their inspections. So these need to be conducted by the trained individual once every seven days at least, and then within 24 hours of a rain event equal to or greater than a half an inch. Um, and I'm really going to try to hit home on these accurate inspections. I know you guys don't want to be sitting in your trucks doing paperwork, um, filling everything out, but that kind of lets us inspectors, it kind of gives us a story and an overview when we come out there of what's happened on your site and what's going on. It is a little suspicious if you have, you know, a rain event and everything looks good on a 10 acre lot. It's that's not always the case. It can be the case, but it does raise a little bit of suspicion wondering if you're actually looking at your site. That's the whole purpose of the inspections. So just a little pointer there because it is a violation to have inaccurate ones. Um, some erosion and sediment controls. We're just going to run through some common ones that we see out in the field and kind of some non-compliant ones versus compliant ones. First is our inlet protection. So sometimes people, you know, it's obviously non-compliant to have nothing. And then we see people that forget to maintain them. And it's not only a hazard or safety issue. It's um, also, as you can see in the middle picture, if water were to go over that and get into there, you have the possibility of a nuisance condition or a discharge off your site. Um, and that's a whole another can of worms we want to get into, but it's not fun to go ahead and have me out there because you discharged off your site. Or um, these do have to be maintained if they're halfway full with sediment. So if it's halfway full, it kind of limits the effectiveness of it. So something that you have to do there also. And these are some compliant ones. If you can see in the top right, Right now, um, with these inlet protections, people aren't putting the right size into the right inlets. So that backing um, does a lot when things are overflowing or anything, or if you know your bag were to fail, things going over the top are a big thing. So I'm running into a lot of them where their backings are too short and it's not doing a lot. Um, and that would be non-compliant. There's baskets, um, some people, have when they're actively working and it's not curbed to do the fence and the bio logs around them. That's a great solution. Stabilization is another big one, especially in subdivisions um, and lots. So the original developer will go ahead and mass grade and then not um, stabilize because they're selling off the lots, but sometimes they're not able to transfer that and try to pass that responsibility on to somebody else within their 14 or seven day period. A uh, large thing that we look for when we're out there is that volunteer vegetation. Um, and that doesn't just pop up overnight. So we're kind of aware that you're not working this area. It hasn't been properly stabilized when we see that. Another thing is, you know, rills and gullies of things being washed out. And that's kind of the whole point of stabilizing is to avoid that. These are some examples. Um, I know they're not always efficient to do. You're every seven or 14 days if you're not working that area, make sure you have it done. So we actually have seen um, in some cases people putting poly over it and anchoring it down with rocks, logs, whatever you can um, that's efficient and effective. And that's a great thing you can do if you know you're not going to be there, poly over it. If you're going to be there back in two, three weeks, but you're out of that 14 day stabilization period, and then you're able to work it right there. Perimeter control, um, another basic one. 
it's tough, especially in those subdivisions where you have that curb right there and you probably have people going in and out. Um, one thing I see um, is people doing bylaws and they're easy to move. You're not having to trench a fence in right against the curb or anything. Um, but that is a big one. And some examples of uh, um, compliant ones are obviously you have your logs and your fences. We are seeing a lot more people doing berms, whether it's a wood chip, a soil berm, those kind of things. I think it's great to use the things you have on your site and it's more of a sell because it's more cost effective. So if you're clearing and you're gonna end up um, using any of the trees and wood chipping them, you might wanna think about just doing that on the site and using that as a filter berm for your perimeter control. And then another big thing is tracking BMPs for vehicles. So really every single site should have at least one tracking BMP. There's no way around it. There's gonna be vehicles going in and out of your job site and tracking sediment out. Um, so a lot of the times we don't see people doing it and that is a violation. And then on top of that, you're gonna have to be sweeping and everything. Other things are, you know, after rainfalls or if you're working right now and you have the snow and all the wet, the rock um, no longer is effective. So you have to go ahead and beef that up, clean it out, do what you have to do. Um, Cause if it's gonna look like the middle picture in that, uh, we're gonna be having a talk. Some compliant ones. Um, in this area, we see a lot of the rocks. I think it's a good option. Um, I mean, I'm not a professional. I don't do construction work. I don't know the ease or anything of doing that and maintaining it. Um, but I know it's probably a little bit more cost effective for these rumble mats or anything. Um, but those are all compliant ones, options. Um, another option I like to say is that if it's really bad, you can wash every truck tire before it leaves your site, but you're probably not gonna be happy doing that. Um, terminating the permit. So it kind of varies when you're working in common plans of development, um, terminating it. The original developer that pulls the original permit, that parent permit is gonna have to keep that open until everything is done, um, which I know is you know, something good to hear, but the good news is that when you get those subdivision registration forms, you kind of pass that responsibility for those lots on. So you don't have to be out there as the original developer with that parent permit, doing your inspections on that seven days, um, every seven days or during rain events, as long as everybody, all your lots and stuff are sold off. Um, but that does need to stay open. And when you can terminate it um, is when your construction activities are complete your vegetation coverage is equal to or greater than a 70% um, expected growth. Your permanent, oh, sorry. Um, your permanent treatment um, for stormwater is construction or constructed and operational. Your sediments cleaned out of your temporary and permanent basins and that all your permanent or all your temporary BMPs have been removed. So you don't wanna be leaving a site with a fence out there. Um, it doesn't look good. It's not a good sell when you sell a home that's fully turfed and you still have a fence hanging out there. Um, and then it's also not, you know, eco-friendly or anything in a violation. So if I see that on your site and it's already terminated, um, I'm probably gonna try contacting you and asking you to go ahead and remove that. And this is just kind of just for that residential area down in this red box is that um, when the permit coverage termination is on the individual lots and they're finished and everything, that um, the permittee who's ever constructing the lot, whether it's the owner or the operator, needs to pass on the MPCA's homeowner fact sheet. So that kind of just doesn't leave the homeowner in the dark on, you know, everything that they might have to do following up on construction activity, if it's maintaining their erosion controls or anything. So I kind of mentioned this right away. This is a parent permit where it needs to stay open until everything's been completed throughout the entire 
common plan of development and that your notice of termination must be um, filed within 30 days of your final stabilization. Um, I know some people come to the fall and you know they're trying to lay down straw, just get in and everything before the winter. Unfortunately, that does need to stay open until the next spring when you have vegetation and you reach that 70% density. Some resources, if uh, I didn't hit anything that you were looking for today, can be found on our website online. This goes from applications forms, our search tools, um, anything you're looking for, contact information. Um, I did just have a name change and we have had a little bit of turnover this last summer in our program. So going to the website is going to be the most up-to-date contact information for your area. Kind of that county map that they showed in the video earlier. And right here, um, number, phone number, email, that's all the same. Um, but I know we did have turnover. Andrew's new. So if you do any work down there, um, your contact did change. And just over a year ago, it was different. It wasn't me. It was another inspector. So we're always kind of changing and shifting. There might be a change in territories as well. So it's something to keep in mind that I don't think it's going to change too much. Um, I'll, I'll still have Crow Wing. My office is here. But things might shift a little. Um, and, you know, if you're not sure, I'm just one phone call away and I can get you to the right person. Any questions? Thank you, Madison. So I'll... I'll just want to jump in really quick here before I open up the question. So I just want to specify a little bit of at least the city of Brainerd and Trevor can expand on Baxter if they have it a little bit differently too. So uh, as you're going through the uh, permitting process locally, uh, when you're putting in the building permit, uh, we do ask if you could include uh, one, if you have the nice big SWIP, that's great. We want to have that on file. Um, but what you're going to do for individual lots, uh, how are you going to control the stormwater uh, runoff or the potential for sediment runoff on your site. We like to see that as part of that package. It goes into the full record of that that building permit. And then that does get circulated through uh, the city staff. The building department looks at their pieces. Uh, the engineering department looks at stormwater uh, utility pieces. Uh, so those are things that we do want to see in that packet, not necessarily piecemealed out to different people. So please include that with the application. Obviously, we have our building permit. Uh, if you're working on an existing street and you have to do a, a new uh, curb cut, we'll have the curb cut uh, street uh, access permit. And then you also have your excavation uh, utility permit. Uh, those are the things that we typically look for when we have a building permit, new building coming in. Uh, again, the, the erosion control is going to be a big part of at least two of the three uh, pieces of that. I guess even the street cut one will be important too mm -hmm. to make sure. We don't have stuff going off right out in the street. So uh, from the permitting side, that's kind of what we're looking for, at, at least for our review. We don't necessarily need to see that you have construction stormwater coverage through the MPCA. If you include it, it's great. It makes us so we don't have to have that question in the back of our mind. Is that, you know, are they covered? Ultimately, it's it's the contractor's responsibility to have that coverage. But it is nice to see that, hey, yeah, we, got, we took care of this uh, coverage. The other side of that is when you do turn over individual lots off of your responsibility. Uh, good communication with city staff to let us know that that if, if you send us that uh, transfer, uh, it helps us know who do we need to be co uh, contacting if there's issues that we see as we're doing our routine inspections um, instead of coming back to you. And I, and I turned that thing over two months ago. Uh, it's good for us to know so we know the appropriate party if there is any issues, who to, who to address those with. Uh, another big piece is SWIP documents on site that helps our inspectors, just like it does MPCA, that those are accessible to us. Uh, we don't want to have to hunt down somebody that's got it in their truck. Uh, that doesn't help anybody out that, hey, I'm, I'm trying to see this and maybe you're half a state away doing a different project. Um, that becomes kind of a problem, especially from the inspector side. Uh, we do like to see that those are kept on site, mailbox, you know, whatever. There's a, a ton of different ways people put their SWIPs out there. Uh, but keeping that stuff on site so it's accessible. Um, other than that, and we do have some of the resources I did put on the table back there that we have on our website. Uh, just some general tips. She mentioned uh, a handful of the different compliance measures and nice BMPs that uh, 
that do get recommended. Again, we have some of those. We have a whole slew of different resources on our website. MPCA has a ton as well. Uh, we encourage you, if you're not familiar with them, uh, take some time, take a look at them. If you have questions, you know, city staff is more than welcome to uh, answer questions, especially on a site-by-site -site basis. I know I just met up with somebody that's wanting to do a, uh, a four unit building right on his site, really take a look at it. You know, what do they require? Where is the water flowing? Uh, some of their general thoughts on what they want to do for BMPs. And, you know, that that's very helpful for him because he's not as versed into this world as uh, some others are. So it was nice for him to get some of those ideas of different ways to approach a specific site. And I know I've, I've definitely taken time out of my day to go meet them out on site. I know our other staff is more than willing to do that too. Uh, just to make sure that as you do that site plan uh, and how you're going to control the uh, stormwater on site, that you're drawing it in a way that, you know, hey, it makes sense for me. Uh, I already had this conversation with them. I know what the intention is behind what you're doing. Um, it really makes it a lot easier for us, at least on the staff side, to review that and a little bit less questions when it goes to the permitting. And we hopefully can accelerate that as fast as possible to get you guys out and digging dirt as fast as uh, possible. I don't know. Do you have anything to add on Baxter's process? No, just as you said, the more information, the better. We do, with any of our grading permits that are over an acre, we require that they submit the NPDES. And, and we go and do inspections on almost all of our sites, even if they're less than an acre. So the more information you can provide us with, the better off we are. And um, kind of to piggyback on what Madison was saying, When you're doing these inspections, if you document your assumptions, so we had a project last year where it needed redundant perimeter control, and the contractor made an assumption on what their perimeter control was for one method and then had a secondary and it wasn't necessarily relayed or it didn't wasn't related to everybody. And after it was brought up, I mean the contractor had a good point. It was a retaining wall that wasn't completely backfilled and yeah there was really no way that sediment was getting through there with how they had it um set up and they had redundant perimeter control but it wasn't necessarily portrayed that way when you showed up on the job site so that's where if you're doing your inspection you know you have the right as certified individuals to make these changes to your SWIP. but if you don't document your changes we might not know and agree with it and then it's one more step in the process so we're saying you're not compliant and you reach out to us and it just it drags on the process so i can't reiterate enough that whatever your assumptions are and and this has been many many different assumptions throughout the time put that down so often we had a project last year madison came out on silt fences on the back side of the drainage it's uphill at a three to one slope nothing's going to leave the site there there was no reason to put silt fence there you guys are out there and you go, well, this engineer never made it out on site. You can make that note, say, of gradient, no drainage, not installing silt fence. Then it doesn't look bad. It looks like you're doing your job, like you're confident. So Madison shows up, she goes, oh, yes, I agree with this. I agree with this. They're taking stormwater serious. And same with me. When I show up on site on our monthly um, inspections that we do, when I go out there, if I see the buy-in from the contractor, it's a lot easier to <clears throat> maybe understand their their thought and to to work with them. Um, it saves everybody a lot of time. So, yeah, without going too far into individual examples, uh, you know, I'm down the list. But I know one thing that I've I've had a comment on a couple different projects is I have to move equipment in here, and if I have silt fence or or bile roll, basically wiping out the whole front, I can't get equipment in there, especially when the driveway is only so wide and you know, I have other vehicles in there. Uh, what I've really advised those guys to do is, uh, it's okay to move those things, get them out of your way if you need to get equipment in there. Uh, just be mindful that we need to put them back in place. If you're moving that equipment, it doesn't track out into the street. Just again, be mindful of the impact because on our side, uh, obviously we have our own permit that we have to do this permit and inspections and enforcement uh, from our perspective because of, of our MS4, uh, but it really keeps our storm sewer system uh, in good condition. I mean, there's the environmental side of it too. Uh, 
if if we start getting heavy sands and some of that gravel into the storm sewer system, that stuff doesn't float. Uh, so even if we get a nice gully washer, it, it just settles at the bottom of manholes. And there's no real way to clean that out except for with the back truck. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to send a guy down in the down in the hole with a shovel to try and clean that stuff out. So uh, we really need to work together to make sure that that stuff doesn't end up in our storm sewer system because it is really uh, a bear for us to have to maintain and clean those things out. So we're trying to keep those safe and keep those expenses on the city side down. Uh, so just be mindful as you're as you're doing this, these works and uh, if you have to make an adjustment or uh, move something around to accommodate a vehicle, just be mindful that, hey, I need to make sure that it closes up behind myself or I, I don't just leave it out for a week type of thing. So. But yeah, just understanding your site again, you're on there every day, if not every other day. Uh, Madison's not there very rarely. Uh, we try to be there at least somewhat regularly, but we're not there every day. You guys are gonna know your site so much better than we are. So when we come and ask a question about stuff, you guys are supposed to be able to help us understand, like you mentioned, the intent behind it and the reasons why uh, that, that training goes, does go an awful long way of you guys understanding where things are going to go and how to control it uh, so you're able to inform our staff when we show up and say hey why is why is this not here well a b and c um, so that helps us a ton when you have that uh, knowledge and that understanding of it so other than that um maybe just to hit on it you know like he said i'm not out there all the time i'm not on your side as often as you i'm not hiding in the bushes waiting for you guys to have violations and come pin you I'm busy. As you saw, I cover all the down to Meeker County, all the way up to Lake of the Woods, uh, kind of cowboy country. Um, so I'm dealing a lot with complaints and unpermitted sites. So part of the thing is, you know, if you have the permit and you're aware, we expect you to be in compliance. We do do routines um, as well. So if you have one pulled, you're not in the clear. Um, I might be busy with other work, but I might get out there as well. Well, with that, is if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, feel free to ask. Do they need open swoop? Is it a public record somewhere to be looked up? Through the PCA? Yeah. So we don't require that you turn in a swoop. So when you're filling out your permit, I haven't gone through it, but